Greetings, everybody. I uh, appreciate the invitation to have my avatar speak here today while I sleep soundly in bed many time zones away. I hope that uh, this session, quite short, nevertheless starts a discussion which can continue afterwards with the facilitators at hand and maybe even by chat or by an open space meeting at a later time. Anyway, uh, without further ado, let's jump into this and let me start like this. We are taught to demand answers, but only at the highest levels of education are we actually encouraged to formulate informed questions. We say, just show me the code. Give me the outcome. Give me practice, not theory. Or let's even put it to a popular vote. Never mind the expertise. So it is also with management and leadership. And while some perceive questions as a threat, we can all benefit from informed analysis, from critical thinking, to avoid mistakes, or at least not to repeat them. Business books, Agile included, apart from a little window dressing, teach mainly by prescription. The seven good habits, the six geese are laying, the five dysfunctions, the four crimes against humanity, and a partridge in a CEO. Um, do this and all will be great. Scrum down, sprint ahead, go through the rituals of respect, and you might not even have to mean them. Use clean language and you can tell, tell people whatever you like. The paradox, I think, of organizations is that sometimes they need to express their humanity and sometimes they need to suppress it voluntarily to show consistency, to be a perfect machine. Think of an orchestra of players who voluntarily give up their autonomy their independence to come together to play in perfect time, to play a symphony, to orchestrate. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, as Spock might have said. And in the climate of, um, you know, our Western political life, it's even getting harder to be honest about these trade-offs. Messaging is all about individual freedoms, rights, um, autonomy, giving, give people more freedom, more right to decide. It's not about cooperation, shared mission, or the greater good. So there are some apparent conflicts of interest going on as well. Now, for many years I wasn't very interested in these issues because I'm a physicist and a technologist by trade. And I'm trained to be dispassionate even when something could be potentially an emotional issue. Sociologists sometimes portray that as being cold, but I prefer to call it even-minded. Uh, we can be mindful of one another, even empathetic, without throwing away rationality or the benefit of experience. So analysis can be a powerful tool. So how do we use it? How do we get alignment in an organization to make uh, individuals come together voluntarily to play like an orchestra? If we only try to think through cooperative patterns instead of leaving outcomes to chance, then in fact we have a chance to grasp a rare opportunity, which is to understand the dynamics of trust and cooperation on a simple accounting level, not even on a motivational level, but on a level that underpins the apparent motivations and economic and economic and emotional drivers, actually. Um, how can we judge a situation impartially and in terms of a few simple patterns that can be repeated? Let me try and give you an example. 
Who gets to make decisions in a group? It turns out that the scale of the problem matters here. When we're face to face in a group, we give decision rights to a leader by appointing them with the promise of a mandate. This is easy to do face to face um, because we see the honesty behind it. We see the meaning behind it. But a mandate is just a willingness to accept the role of that individual as decision maker in that context. Not necessarily in all contexts, that would be too much, but we give a mandate in a particular circumstance where we believe that individual has expertise germane to the problem. And we give that mandate, we promise that mandate, I will follow you. So why would anyone give their mandate to another? Well, clearly because there's a value in doing so. It could be the greater experience, the expertise, simply charisma, even, even money. Um, whatever the perceived value in appointing that leader, it's real to each individual who gives it. And that's what's important because it tends to, it means that that individual will then keep that promise and not divert from it or renege on that promise later. And that makes the role of leadership more stable. So then assuming some ways of resolving disagreements can be found because a leader isn't just one person's mandate, it's the mandates of many. This can in principle be turned into a, a more stable relationship for the lifetime of that decision matter. And of course, assuming that the appointee accepts the appointment, we start to accept this voluntary subordination as a pattern a pattern that we can use to bring order to a disparate group of individuals seeking leadership. And hopefully the privilege accorded with that appointment isn't abused by the appointee, of course remains to be seen. That would be a breach of trust and it would cause the promises to be broken in the future. But this process of promising based on an assessment of potential value and trust is what we call authorizing or authorization. And it's one of the key patterns in the open leadership network. It doesn't always work like this though. On the larger scale, roles are more separated based on perhaps many different concerns. And often the desire for role stability will come into conflict with the desire for role suitability and there's a, clearly a value in stability too too much change brings disorder disarray to an organization prevents us from getting work done so in a larger organization there is there are greater challenges there's there are more long distance relationships there is perhaps a headquarters involved which takes on a kind of a leadership role with a perceived authority, but not one based on a mandate, it's one based on ownership. There is a convention in our society, enshrined in our society, if you like, that if you own something, then it's yours to break. So there is a cultural sense in which power is ownership and ownership is power. And that's not a real mandate provided from the bottom up. It comes from the top down. So we may have shareholders who really own the company and headquarters who think they own their employees because they're paying for them. But what's the mandate? If we follow the previous pattern, then it seems now to be in reverse. The shareholders appoint a CEO or headquarters central command, if you like, on the basis that they see perceived shareholder value or dividend value from that appointment. By appointing this person, they will bring greater profit to me. So there is a mandate sort of from below to appoint a, a leader. 
and then headquarters or the C-suite or the CEO may see their role as appointing the team of workers, owning them actually, you know, uh, and therefore taking their compliance for granted because they're paying for them. But now the dynamics is upside down because one appointing many from, from the CEO or the headquarters appointing many workers uh, rather than many workers appointing a single leader for guidance. And what, what is the perceived value in that? Just doing what you've been assigned to do is not clear guidance. Uh, and that's usually all that a CEO kind of appointment is, is promised. It's pretty unclear. So people end up in, in roles in their organizations where they don't actually know what they're supposed to do for each other. They don't know what they're supposed to promise for one another. They only know that they're being imposed upon with certain outcomes. Often we even hire workers to figure out what to do because companies don't know initially how to get stuff done. They need the expertise of the workers to do that. So there is a flaw in this reasoning about leadership. If the actual expertise to select a path going forward is going against the direction of presumed authority, then suddenly we have conflicting mandates mandates from shareholders to generate shareholder value, impositions from leadership to give people titles, but actually a direction for product and outcome coming from below without a, la without a mandate for the leadership to coordinate them. And what about the shareholders versus the employees? There are no direct promises between the shareholders and the employees. So what connects their authorization to the value of the team? If we can't answer these questions, an organization may actually not be bound very strongly together. It might fly apart because there is a lack of order and there's no seed around which autonomous individuals will give their mandate to come together. Compare it to how we look at nation states. You know, if we look at a nation state, it's slightly different. There's a government. And regardless of how socialist or libertarian you happen to be, there are basic motivational considerations that we can expose using this kind of thinking. First, there's value in having leadership to create the seeds around which we come together. And that mandate typically has to come from below, from the people. There's also value of direct face-to-face -face promises between the givers and the receivers of a mandate and their leadership. And the givers and receivers are not really government directly. In most cases, they're the employers who provide for us on a day-to-day -day basis. So this doesn't have to be done by voting. There are other ways, of course. Um, but there has to be a mutual value in these relationships, these power relationships, to keep them stable. And when parties like employers come in between that, in between government and the people, uh, government might perhaps impose onto employers telling them things that they have to do by law. And in turn, organizations might impose upon their workers, you should do this by, by the terms of your employment. But that circumvents, that's, that, those layers of imposition circumvent any direct bond between people and governance. To restore that, governments are a little bit smarter than companies. They tend to speak directly to the people, not through the middlemen who actually provide for us. They go on TV, they act, uh, you know, provide the promises directly to the people which are then voted on. So. This, even this simple form of direct communication builds more trust between the two and therefore more stability. So on the level of society, we've done slightly better, a slightly better job than we do in most companies. We sometimes forget that when designing the leadership dynamics within an organization with middlemen in between, 
that these same ideas apply. Distance can be a killer. The lack of a direct relationship can be the undoing of organization. The simple dynamics of these patterns of face-to-face -face mandate and trust explain these simple relationships on a basic level. And this is the kind of analysis that's based on an algebra of cooperation that I call promise theory. In the open leadership network, it forms the basis for a kind of program code uh, for cooperation, an algebra of cooperation. And in fact, the basic insights of this work that I did came out of the technology work that I do. Then we discovered later how to apply those same patterns for human cases. And it can be as simple as drawing out a few diagrams. By drawing out these diagrams and by following some principles, which I haven't uh, shown here, there's more to, more to tell, um, the method helps to expose the value chains and the missing links that may be in them that help us to transform wishful thinking, wishful force, wishful direction, wishful leadership into voluntary cooperation by mandate. What even this simple example shows is that we have to carefully construct the dynamics of human and inhuman aspects of organization on all levels and at all times, especially during change, because even if the balance of authority is slightly uneven, we can topple an entire structure from a single missing promise. So that balance, restoring that balance through mandate, through leadership, through an, an ongoing trust relationship that builds upwards rather than spiraling downwards is essential. Across the world we have a culture of imposition, I would say, command and control, edict, laws, but trust and loyalty are the results of sustained beneficial interactions, not of impositions, a world based on clear and kept promises rather than on transactional impositions or legal ownership is much more likely to succeed. Now I know this is only a snippet, merely the tip of an iceberg, but I wanted to whet your appetites to learn more about promise theory and the engineering of cooperation that it enables. And what I hope I managed to illustrate here is that by asking some of these basic questions about cooperation, by thinking more like an engineer rather than rubber stamping canned answers, we can diagnose uh, solutions to every situation without simply ritualizing behaviors or reading from books. All we need is a little forethought and clear intentions and lines of communication, more face-to-face -face dynamics that allow mandates and authorizations for leadership to come about of their own accord. So thanks for listening. I hope you all have a great discussion afterwards, and I hope to meet some of you in person at a later date.